Joan, if it's all right with you, would you mind going back to the presentation and let's go through it quickly till we get to the microbial selective part to make sure that everybody's on the same page again? Because we kind of ran out of time at the end there, right? Yeah. Yeah, the host integration part was uh, was really fascinating. But we didn't spend enough time with it, I don't think. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, then you want me to uh, skip to the end? Um, let's just go through it quickly, like just to kind of remember, remind everybody if okay. people have questions, just like a slide every five seconds <laughs> to remind ourselves where we're at. <laughs> okay, um, they're the definitions. And I've chased down the additional references uh, concerning these uh, definitions that you sent in an earlier email, Forrest. So that's good. Um, yeah, those were ones I didn't know. There's another book that someone just sent me to that I can find for you. It's even earlier. It's from the, like the 40s, which I had never heard of. Um, okay, then uh, the integration issue being important. These are some of the people who've taken sides on this, which I'm hoping this this uh, framing of the discussion of holobine evolution in terms of a, of a dispute uh, can is passe now. Um, <laughs> Because it's oh, yeah, go for it. So, so because I'm still trying to get my so, would you say that the ones on the left are more evolutionary and the ones on the right more ecological? So, that's the first question. And then, Forrest in his email said, Let's use monobiomes instead of monobiomes because it's a W, and I was not sure in, in, in which context. You want to use that only or no well i mean it's a, it's a big question so like i don't know we could argue there so roughly speaking no that these are a mixture of ecologists and evolutionists on both sides of this mm -hmm. um and yeah i don't know how yeah, it's kind of, and some of it is people making their, even their own arguments, right, that go past, uh, it, it's very confusing, actually, the literature, um, people are asking, arguing past each other, is my, uh, at, in my experience. So because yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say the, the people on the left tend to be uh, microbiologists or um, in the case of Scott, a developmental biologist. So, the, and the people on the right tend to be more uh, evolutionarily trained or population biologically trained. And so, I, I don't know if, if this is fair, Forrest, but it seems to me as though the folks on the left are t tend to. Um, uh, it's, it's almost uh, tend to be wishing that uh, microbes can have their day in the sun. <laughs> the, yes, <laughs> I think that's exactly right. <laughs> that's uh, a great way to say it. <laughs> and uh, they've, you know, they've got, they get a bad rap. Is, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the folks on the right are more in the population tradition of, uh, looking at uh, competition and uh, selfishness and and uh, and just wanting to see it spelled out in in population terms and so they tend to find the the statements that are sometimes rather grandiose coming from the folks on the left as just not being well founded it's being uh, uh, more than conjecture just it's the way popular it's the way ecologists and evolutionists look at evolutionary psychologists for example they make grand yeah. statements all the time and we say you know you've got to stop that that's yeah. yeah evolution is not just what you say it you want it to be 
it's its actual process and um, and so so there's that that kind of online uh, dichotomy here between the 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 I think well-founded skepticism by the people on the right but the people on the left are pointing to the integration that occurs uh, and Scott especially who, who doesn't make grandiose statements and um, and so the so the dilemma as I saw it was that you had the reality of the integration between host and microbiome and then you had claims that that integration was caused by this holobiont by selection on the holobiont level uh, on the the microbes the microbiome and the host as an integrated unit in some sense, an integrated evolutionary unit in some sense. And, um, but that doesn't have to be the explanation for the, for the reality of the integration. That's what needs to be uh, investigated, is just what is causing this. And uh, in my first paper, the one, um, well, I, I wrote a, a few papers. So my very first paper, was uh, with uh, Elena and Jean and Scott Gilbert as co-authors. And that's when I was laying out the basic uh, diagram, life cycle diagram, and to see whether or not people were comfortable with that, in which I was um, conceptualizing the life cycle in, as a discrete generation uh, problem and, and, uh, and and just kind of figuring out whether or not people were happy with the way I was looking at the problem, and that they seemed to be. And then I was modeling both vertical and horizontal um, uh, transmission. And then the second, then that gave rise to the paper that I wrote uh, singly that came out in philosophy, theory, and practice in biology. Um, and that's one which was purely computer simulation. And that looked at uh, both, again, uh, vertical and horizontal transmission. And I, I was by this point persuaded that the majority of the cases of uh, microbiome acquisition is horizontal. And so, so the question was, how could you still get integration with horizontal transmission? Because up until then, it was assuming that you needed vertical transmission, which is, of course, why the people on the left tend to always emphasize vertical-like transmission. And uh, so, so that's what, so I wrote that model, and, um, uh, and it did show that you could get some, that holobiont selection did have an effect. And um, so I thought that was, positive from the standpoint of the people on the left that they were that they were happy about that but of course it's just a computer simulation and you couldn't say too much about it other than that well yeah it has an effect yeah yeah so you can push micro fr uh, frequencies around through holobiont selection and if the microbes carried advantageous genes and then you had selection on the holobiont level you would get more of those microbes <coughs> Um, but it, uh, and that one used Poisson sampling. So then, as you know, I, the last, the most recent papers, then a set of papers, uh, the one you're currently looking at uses Poisson sampling. The, its predecessor, which was still on BioArchive but not published, used binomial sampling. <clears throat> and this one, <clears throat> because of the assumption of different time scales, I, I was able to get a lot analytically for it. So this one has, this paper is primarily mathematical results that are then confirmed with computer simulation. So this is a much stronger paper. And, um, but what it does show is that even though the holobiont selection can affect microbe freak genes in micro, gene frequencies in microbes, it doesn't do it very well. Um, and that the, the, the sampling process, the Poisson process, um, 
uh, homogenizes the hologenotypic variation, and so that uh, retards the progress of uh, holobiont selection. And, um, and so compared to, if you had two alleles, if you had an, a gene that you <laughs> wanted, so to speak, uh, to evolve, uh, put it in the nucleus. It'll evolve under, uh, uh, it'll evolve much faster if the gene is there rather than if the gene is in the, uh, in a microbe. And that's because uh, Mendelian inheritance uh, and transmission via the gametes uh, uh, doesn't do any, because it, it underwrites a Hardy-Weinberg law. So there's no loss. There's no, um, the, 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 colon, the, colon is, the uh, ma mating system, the random mating is neutral to the selection pressures. Whereas if the genes are in the microbes, then the colonization process <clears throat> means that the genes are, th that, uh, that the colonization process is not neutral to, to selection. And uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's a really big problem um, if, if you want to argue that the host um, microbiome adaptation or, or integration is brought about by holobiont selection. So, uh, and yet the integration occurs. And so that then led to the last section of the paper in which I was hunting around for, well, just how could it develop? And, and in the back of my mind all this time, I'd, I'd heard about both Scott and um, Tom Prideau, who's in France at Bordeaux University, talking about the immune system and how the immune system is like a gatekeeper for microbes. And, um, and that winds up uh, reducing, so, so the, if you expand on that, um, uh, then, then you wind up with what I feel is, a, at the moment, <laughs> is, is a viable hypothesis for how the integration forms. Is, is, I, I went on too long there, I bit. Was that okay? <laughs> Oh, that's really interesting, and yeah. you know, I, I really think it is. So you would say that what you find in, in, in your work or in this paper is also uh, kind of not in agreement with this thought that the holobiont is an integrated unit of the, so that the, mi the microbes and, and the host are like becoming one unit. That, that's what the people on the left say there, right? So you can see it as one unit. But you say that these data that you're producing now are also proof that that is not a correct way of thinking. Yeah. Right? So they become they become a unit, but not through holobiont selection. They become an integrated physiological unit. I guess I would have to say a holobiont is a physiological unit and not an evolutionary unit. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and that's that's kind of and uh Briefly, I'm just going to, and then Joan, you can, because you know better, but the people on the right, so like, um, they would tend to, they came out of um, people that are very uh, cautious about any group selection stuff, because historically, there's been lots of arguments about um, uh, how you get group selection versus kin selection and a number of other things in the evolutionary uh, field. So that's why the, there was an argument to tell you the answer not true, uh, or I thought that, that was the main thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's right. You said uh, group selection arguments, anyone who with an evolutionary or population background is very, very wary of evolution, of um, group selection type arguments. And so that's what leads to these concepts of multi-level selection, which are attempts to, um, clarify how group selection could operate, leaving aside how common they are. Um, yeah. so, so the question is just whether or not it's even logically possible to have group selection. And uh, when I was a student, people thought it was not even possible. Then yeah. a number of investigators since then you know, came up with models that showed, showed that it was possible. And there, there were then even a couple experimental cases. Uh, there was one case I remember that I think it was Rob Colwell or somebody 
looked at um, uh, the insects living in pitcher plants <laughs> and uh, uh, developed a, uh, uh, an experimental setup for, for, for group selection there and more, more of a type one type group selection and multi-level selection. And uh, Michael Wade, I think Michael Wade worked with experimentally with tribolium beetles or something like that. Um, so there were some cases where you could show it could happen, but, um, and David Sloan Wilson has almost made a career of saying it's extremely general, but it, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, I think the, I, I don't know how many biologists think it, it, it is common, multi-level selection. Uh, um, well, you know, there was, there was a math, the math attack was pretty strong. So Novak, you, you guys remember him? He, he's kind of dropped off the map, map a little, but he was a guy at Harvard uh, who did, basically, he did show how you could get this multi-level selection um, pretty convincingly, uh, but his best friend was also Jeffrey Epstein, so <laughs> so he's kind of not around as much anymore. But uh, the um, so there have I I would say mathematically some people have pushed that have shown that there are some possibilities of this actually working, um, not just the experimentalists. Would you say that's true? Do yeah. they do they um, do these Mathematical proposals look at uh, the separation of time scales because I think that's a really important feature of John's model. Uh, I wouldn't know. Uh, there's uh, uh, Elon Eschel, who, who's an Israeli, uh, is one of the first ones to do this. Um, the, the uh, back in my early my early book, I even went through Elon Eschel's case and presented it in, 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 as a textbook case. Uh, spoke to him about it. He was very happy with that. But that had a almost like a genetic drift setup to it, um, where um, you'd get these local, it was a metapopulation kind of structure. So you'd have little local populations here and there. And, uh, and then you could get, um, the, you know, the setup would tend to be within groups, you'd have the selfish gene um, increasing in frequency, but, but, but then the, the um, subpopulations, which had lots of altruists would still make more uh, offspring and um, and so the group as a whole, there'd be more. Those groups would would um, increase relative to the groups with a lot of selfish in it. So it was tended the early models about group selection tended to be framed around selfish versus altruist, and how do you get altruism evolving via some kind of group selection mechanism? And it uh, they were intra specific, um, so. That's another thing that's a little bit different about the holobionts is that you're dealing with two species, whereas most of the early, uh, most of the group selection literature has been about genotypes within a species, whether they're altruistic or selfish or not, and how to get them evolving. So to, to answer your question, Jim, I think they were all discrete generation models. Um, but there were, the issue of time scale didn't really arise because there would be only one time scale. There'd be um, within one generation, the, everyone would be in a um, in a group. Then the group would reproduce, and then then you'd come to the next generation. So you didn't have the whole two species set up. I can't offhand. I don't think even Novak's paper had two species in it. It was always genotypes within yeah. a species, right? Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think, what about uh, quasi-species stuff? Um, there's no time 
<clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. yeah. You've read that, Jim, right? Uh, yeah, I have thoughts on it, but what I don't yeah. remember. I would have to think about what that means because I haven't thought about that for a while. So I can stop this probably the strongest, that, sorry, the most accepted of where you can basically have less fit things from one point of view in the same population and yeah. it allows the whole population to work. Um, that would be my feeling, but, but there's no time delay or anything that matters there that I can think of. Yeah, the, um, yeah. I mean, and we can argue about this forever. It's kind of like a beer talk a little bit because it's it's cool, but um, <clears throat> what I think is important is that now we have something that goes a little past it, right? And maybe we could figure out how to use it. Yeah. Um, so let's see what you, so you would say, Jim, from your point of view, the feature that you're, that is most important is the time delay part. Well, it seems, uh, it, I don't know, it seems to open up the dynamic possibilities uh, in, a, in a clearer way. Um, I wish I had thought more about it. Um, I think Joan is like the perfect intermediary here because Joan, would you say that the people on the, on the right are more mathematical because they're ecologically oriented? No, um, none of them are theoreticians. Uh, um, yeah, um, they're more, they're, everybody's, but they're definitely more, um, like roughly speaking, there's a little speaking past each other too, right? Because like then Margulis was, she was really thinking, she was really, she's the one that did the, that endosymbiont theory, right? Of like the chloroplasts and the, and the uh, mitochondria. And so she had a very strong view of how you could migrate the, the genes to the nucleus and get that to, to work really well, um, but not, not very strong theoretical. Um, Nancy on the other side is um, also a very strong experimentalist. And she looks at kind of um, uh, the endosymbiotic uh, uh, bacteria in insects. And they have very similar features, honestly. So kind of what Nancy is studying is how you get to where Lynn uh, proposed, uh, basically, right? So Lynn, uh, would you say, I would, I would give credit for the endosymbiotic theory to Lynn, wouldn't you, Joan? Like yeah, she I, I do too. I mean, she, there's yeah. a, uh, um, there's a, a movie about her, a documentary, um, and with a lot of footage from her. And, and she, I think she's very good at crediting others. Um, and so in some sense, you could say that she was a publicist of it. She doesn't claim to be the first person to think of the holobiont. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, but I, I think it's, fair in some sense to attribute this to her because she's the one who really carried the water <laughs> on um, uh, symbiosis and uh, endosymbiosis especially and and the role of the micro mitochondria the, the, the uh, origin of the mitochondria as bacteria and the chloroplasts as bacteria and their incorporation into the eukaryotic cell and um, so uh, she's, but she's a, a complicated person, I gather. Uh, others have pointed out, <laughs> others have pointed out to me that she has some other uh, stands which are quite difficult. Uh, I think in in nine eleven, I think she, she, she sometimes has conspiracy theor theories that she gets fined, and and uh, uh, I I only met her once. Uh, I was in a. Uh, actually in the Galapagos of all places for a meeting 
and she was there and we were out in the intertidal zone looking at walking around and uh I mean, she doesn't sit there and sort of expound big ideas in front of you. She was busy trying to find out whether or not her granddaughter had uh, had a, a new toy or, or was was healthy or something. And so she was being very maternal and very grandmotherly, and and you, you couldn't even have told discerned that she was a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and so she clearly has, you know, a lot of angles, <laughs> a very interesting person. And she's super, she's really interesting, or she was, uh, and she, she was uh, very, there's a circle that's like, uh, it's not really clear how it all worked, but basically Sagan and Lovelock and Margulis were uh, really intellectually worked together a lot. Um, uh, in all these different ways. So that's, that was a uh, very, so she did have a whole bunch of different ideas that of course turned out not to be correct, but that's, and she was spouting off some very interesting ideas. <laughs> she was, must have been tough as hell too. I guess she got attacked really badly um, when she first was po pushing this stuff out. Yeah. So let's keep going. So, okay. so that's roughly the debate, yeah. So, um, so the, in my first paper, that's where this, uh, the first one I wrote where I was the sole author that, and, and that's where this issue of collective inheritance comes in, because the question was, how could you get, um, the evolution of, um, of anything, including, uh, at a, uh, uh, integration, if, uh, for a holobion, if the genes were in in the uh, 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 in the micro in, in the microbiome, and uh, and I was at this debate which uh, Tom Prado organized, uh, in which uh, Scott uh, in which uh, Ford Doolittle was there, and Ford and it was set up as like a uh, a debate with two sides, and I was on the pro holobion side and Ford was on the skeptical side and and Ford made a big deal about how uh, you couldn't get holobion uh, evolution uh, with microbial genes with the genes being in the in the microbiome rather than in the nucleus because he said that you needed to have um, uh, heritable fitness and he showed a picture of Lewinton he was into this and in showing pictures of old white men, you know, <laughs> and he had Lewinton there uh, with and Lewinton enunciated the criteria for uh, natural selection that population genetics gen genuflect in front of. And one of them is that there has to be phenotypic variation, that the phenotypes are associated with different fitnesses and the fitnesses have to be heritable. And that's there. This is a quote from his paper. And by heritable, it was understood that that was parent offspring heritability. And, and yet it was clear from, from the modeling that I was doing that you were getting uh, a holobiont uh, evolution, maybe not as much as nuclear uh, evol evolution via nuclear genes, but you were getting some holobiont evolution from microbial genes. And that's when I realized that there was uh, this phenomenon that I was calling collective inheritance versus lineal inheritance. Now, in lineal inheritance down here, uh, uh, the where selection is favoring the green genes, um, the way if selection is favoring the green genes, and you get more green genes in the next generation, and how do the offspring get them? They get them directly from their own parents. And that's um, lineal inheritance, but they don't have to get them that way. As long as the uh, selected parents contribute their genes and, and the unselected ones don't, as long as the selected uh, parents contribute their genes to a common urn or pool, and then they're redistributed to the offspring, you wind up with the same endpoint. And so from the standpoint of evolution, 
evolutionary progress can occur with this mechanism of inheritance, just with this mechanism of inheritance. And Darwin's theory, of course, is agnostic as to what the mechanism of inheritance is because it was written before Mendel. And um, so there's potentially a whole grab bag of possible modes of inheritance that would underlie, underwrite uh, uh, evolution um, in the sense of descent with modification. So, uh, so I had to point this out here that uh, that the offspring fitness needs to correlate with selected parents, not necessarily their own parents, and that uh, Lewontin's um, catechism here really isn't um, one that we have to uh, follow. Uh, and I think that that was, I feel, the main message to come out of my uh, philosophy, theory, and practice in biology article, the 2020 article I'll refer to it as. And um, so then uh, uh, the question is, in what, how, how can you take holobiont selection, holobiont evolution, and fit it into the multi-level selection literature? Um, I mean, is it uh, sui generis, or is it just an extension of the existing literature? And I think this is a hard call um, because the more you look at the existing literature, the more different it is. Um, that with, um, and, and the, my paper, you know, has references to, to where all these things are defined. Uh, Okasha is a particularly good authority on these definitions. Um, and multi-level selection one that Maynard Smith modeled has the selected Again, these are single species models. So these would be the selected genes within a species going into a pool and distributed out, but that the, uh, and that the envelope that contains them doesn't evolve. And so Maynard Smith called this a haystack. And we were looking at the evolution of mice, um, which were altruistic to one another or not. Then there's multi-level selection two, uh, in which the host evolves as well. So, uh, so these genes. So, uh, so, so the, uh, let me back. The adaptive value of the green genes in this setup has to do with their differential contribution to the pool. So the green ones make more green genes that get redistributed. Here, the green genes confer upon the host or upon the carrier of the genes an, uh, an adaptive value. So, so this unit reproduces more as a unit and you get them over here. And then this unit doesn't reproduce. And this has the flavor of uh, a microbiome with vertical transmission, but this this was modeled in the case for for single genes. So so here's um, and and so and then in contrast, if you put them both together, you would get this kind of setup here, where the the host evolves and also. It does so by virtue of um, contributing its its genes to a, a common pool. Now, I mean, initially I thought that that's all there was, and that we could just equate microbiome. Um, we could equate holobiont selection with multi-level selection three. That that that's all it was. <clears throat> But then it became clear in the analysis that these things are finite in size. These aren't just genes. These are, are microbes. And so it, when you think of genes, there's one locus and two alleles. There's only the gene copy number on, of an allele is two um, or, one, or one or two and every in a diploid. So, um, 
so so the issue of the density dependence of the genes never comes up there's always just two of them <laughs> because it's a diploid but if these these are our organisms our, our bacteria well then the copy number can go from uh, you, you know a couple to begin with and then it grows up through time and within the generation and comes to an equilibrium carrying capacity <laughs> well um, that means there's density dependence in here and so one gene so this kept coming up you know later in the paper that uh, if this gene, if this microbe is competitively superior to this microbe, this microbe can't even get into the, can't even get into the host. It's excluded from the host. And uh, so that the, uh, the density dependence is uh, the finiteness of the host is, uh, is, a, is a big difference. And so that's why I've concluded in the end that holobiont selection is not even multi-level selection three. It's multi-level selection three plus density within host density dependence. And um, uh, I mean, it's possible no, that this... Yes? In the model that you have in the end that you work with, so yeah. there is not a final density there, right? You, you allow the density to to change. Yeah. The carrying capacity is then a trait, is then subject to selection, to, to holobiont selection. And I, I made it, uh, you know, uh, you, you, in response to your um, email, Arled, I, I made a diagram last night, which I could show if you'd like like to see, see the life cycle for, for the whole for the whole shooting match for for both the microbes and the uh, yeah that's, yeah so I have to stop the share and share a different um, screen Let me share this one okay do you see that one yeah now uh, I haven't model this because this is pretty big but um okay so so this would be two host alleles with vertical transmission okay so, and also two microbial strains with horizontal transmission this is this is then the full, a full system so here you have so let's start here start the generation here we have a host gamete pool and we have a microbial source pool. And we have two alleles uh, in the host nucleus, uh, red and blue, okay? And they, re they uh, uh, combine through random union of gametes or random mating. <clears throat> so, so that the juvenile uh, hosts have three genotypes in Hardy-Weinberg ratios for these. So they have red-red, red-blue, and blue-blue in hardy one in binomial ratios, okay? Then these are in turn colonized by microbial sampling of the microbial source pool, giving rise to four so-called hologenotypes. So these are this column right here would be the juvenile hosts that weren't colonized by any microbe. It's always that probability. These are the juvenile hosts colonized by only the green microbe. These one from only the brown ones and these colonized by both. And then, then we have the time, the within generation time step. So these come to, th these have, the fitness associated with no microbes, but the fitnesses will differ because they have different nuclear um, genomes. And then these will be the fitnesses of uh, <clears throat> the the uh, holobionts that have only green microbes. <laughs> this will be the fitness. Uh, so, <laughs> so a green microbe could come to an equilibrium 
abundance within the host. <clears throat> so that's microbe number one is, is green. And this is a homozygous host, a heterozygous host, and a homozygous host for the blue allele. And you'd get three different possible carrying capacities. And similarly, if there's only a green one, and then, or I mean only a brown one, and then this would be if there's a green and a brown one, we, these would be the equilibrium population sizes for these two interacting microbes, N1 and N2, in a host that's homozygous for red. And this is in a host that's homozygous for uh, a heterozygous, and this is homozygous for, for, for red. For, for blue. So then uh, after the microbial com community comes to equilibrium, then we have whole alliance selection on these. So each one of these contributes back to the pools over here. So all four row, all three rows here contribute um, genes to the gamete pool. And these this block right here contributes um, to the microbial source pool. And then this goes around again. So that in full detail is what, uh, what the model would be. But I didn't think there was any point in, in studying this mathematically because it's already complicated, really complicated. Um, without adding in the um, uh, the, the host genetics as well. Uh, and, and so that's why I went to the strategy type analysis in which uh, we look at um, the optimal strategy for the host and then the optimal colonization um, uh, strategies for the for the microbes and then that then that process can give rise to the to the integrated holobiont so is that help Alec? So, so just that i understand well so this is just a schematic and just a drawing but you say the random units of of gameless is that picture on top is the red and the blue but I mean, when you would look how many exist and draw it according to that, you would have twice as much that blue combinations, right? Because there's always going to be more of the combinations and of the that red or blue pool that you do. Yeah, the, the microphone quality is really oh, funny. Uh, you have to get close. Okay. Can oh. you relay it, Forrest? Or I'm here. I'm going to make no, us. Let me say. So, so when. So this is just a representation, the red rats. So you have three times red rats, and three times blue blue, and three times red blue. But then you actually would do a random combination. Yeah. They would probably come out with three times red rat, three times blue blue, and six times red blue. But I mean, it's just the way yeah. that you draw it. But you said, OK, there's, there's some of all. But you didn't try to make that mathematical. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, it does simply, because of the random colonization, particularly for the binomial uh, 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 sampling, uh, you do, it does simplify. And when I, when I was doing, um, in, in the earlier version of the model, um, I had binomial sampling, not only here, but also here, I had binomial sampling in both places, um, and and it, it does boil down to uh, one gene frequency for for the host and and one gene frequency for the uh, microbe. Um, but I can't can't boil it down like that here uh, with the Poisson sampling, and. Um, and it's and also it's not clear that you learn anything uh i mean i, I think the mo the picture itself is kind of all you get out of it but but if you get really complicated dynamics here what do you learn from it uh 
because it then becomes implausible that you have any, you can't assign much weight to any particular case. <laughs> uh, and so, so this is where you decided that um, all the interesting features are really just in the Poisson sampling. In other words, you don't need the vertical type transmission. You can, that's kind of an add-on or something. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and conceptually, it's the horizontal part, which needs to be explicated. We know all about, right. um, yeah. yeah, the vertical um, transmission in, of the of the gametes. And so I can just appeal to um, existing knowledge saying, well, evolution on the, uh, the red and the blue here is going to lead to increasing the fitness of the uh, um, of the host and so that's why in the strategic in the strategy analysis I'm assuming that that the I guess you'd call it like the dose response curve that is the number of antibodies made per um, contribution per effect of the microbe um, there is a curve in there. I assume that's an optimal curve obtained by maximizing fitness of the host. And, and so we get a, an antibody response to microbes, which is a curve, you know, degree of response to, to impact of, of microbe, uh, just by maximizing host fitness. So you can compute that. And, and you compute that assuming that that the production of antibodies ha has a certain cost and that once you have them, you have a certain benefit. And um, so I was assuming that the benefit uh, had a decreasing return to scale, but that the cost of making an antibody was linear with the number of antibodies. And the pair of those together gives you an optimal antibody production for any given uh, amount of uh, microbial impact. And then you start varying the microbial impact, you get a different level of optimal antibody production for each um, level of, uh, for each level of antibody, uh, of microbial impact. And so that I was referring to that as the price. Uh, so, um, so that's basically what the micro, what the host is going to do with its nuclear genes, irrespective of the impact. <laughs> that that has on the microbes and so that and then the microbes are stuck trying to um, uh, decide how much to give the host in order to be able to colonize so i'm curious uh do discussions of symbiosis deal with this kind of economic transactional kind of mechanism uh that's a good question yeah a little um I mean, where where uh, things change on the basis of of the uh, how the transaction yeah evolves. Uh, yeah, uh, let me see. I, I mean, my former student Errol Ache did one with a it was a transactional kind of model like this for um, um, legumes and root nodules. Um, oh yeah, and, and that was where. What was interesting about that involved, uh, you know, in a transactional game like this, the question is, uh, what's the equilibrium? And and he had a, met, a scheme in which the equilibrium outcome of the game was the, the solution of a, Na a Nash bargaining solution oh. rather, than, rather than a Nash competitive equilibrium, rather than a Nash equilibrium. Was he able to explain the uh, the sort of uh, unusual oxygen concentration that seems to be uh, kind oh, of paradoxical? I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, he, I mean, this was like 10, 15 years ago. Um, and... Uh, uh, how common is this? Yeah, uh, yeah, right. 
I mean, because that those are common, the physiological trade-offs. Yeah. Are, that's usually what people would be talking about, Jim. Yeah, exactly. They be, because uh, a lot of the symbiosis literature, though, winds up being about cheaters. And um, not so much about the, I mean, it's implicit that there's a trade-off. So, so in a transaction like this, how do you get more uh, without paying for it, <laughs> in effect? And so then that comes up with uh, mechanisms to police uh, the, the uh, exchange and then the cost of the policing. Policing isn't free. And, uh, and so there tends to be this um, focus in the, symbi in the symbiosis interactions as to how to keep everybody honest. Is that fair to say, uh, uh, Forrest? Yes. Yeah. And I'd say that's been, a lot of the arguments have been trying to resolve that exact problem, right? Because the cheaters uh, break down the normal exchange that people are interested in. And yeah. so I think you're right that the assumption, it's implicit to everybody's argument that there is some sort of trade-off going on. Yeah, and, um, and and of course the promise to uh, the holobiont selection uh, yeah. idea <clears throat> was that um, the the multi level nature of it uh, circumvented the cheater issue uh -huh. that um, it you, you uh, that a cheater only cheated themselves. If they were inside a, a, a host, because they hurt the host, they would die. And this tends to be the rationale too to the to the reduction of uh, pathog uh, pathogenicity uh, that uh, that viruses are supposed to get less pathogenic uh, through coevolution with the host. And there's a lot of lore to that effect. Um, well, I, I've heard people speculate about the COVID uh, yeah. pandemic as as going in that direction. Does that mean? Yeah, and so one of the things I'd like to look at in the future would be um, to to specialize this kind of model and not look at integration so much, but look at the evolution of the reduction of microbial virulence in a holobiont context, because a lot of the conjecture. You know about host microbi microbiome coevolution is framed as a coevolutionary problem, which is a single level problem, and um, and of course you could use the word coevolution very broadly and refer to any kind of interaction between species, but I tend to take a narrow meaning that coevolution refers to two uh, species at the same hierarchical level, whereas uh, Holobiont selection refers to, if you will, uh, interaction or interactive evolution at two hierarchical levels. Um, and I'm not sure everyone will agree, feel like, uh, you, you know, my definition is maybe too narrow for them, but that's how I'm using it. I'm being quite clear about the distinction between one or two hierarchical levels. Um, okay, shall I take this graph off and put the? Yeah, oh, I, I have a quick, I have a quick question if I can. So, I just want to make sure I understood you. You said that you essentially feel as though you can neglect the host genetics because that stuff's already worked out. Is that correct? Well, that's. Uh, <laughs> We don't want, want to put it quite so strongly <laughs> as to ne neglect, but uh, the... Uh, well, not neglect, but you can leave yeah. that out. But I was really wondering, is that if you have conditional fitness that's based on your microbiome, so yeah, say yeah. red and blue is normally the most fit, but then red, red is actually more fit if you get a green microbe. Yeah. In that well, case, yeah, then, yeah. then it's not worked out at all. Is that correct? Yeah, that's not worked out at all. And, and so uh, you could then, in just the same sort of procedure I used earlier in the paper, you could write out uh, equations for all 
uh, four times three, all 12 hologenotypes here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and based on this setup. Um, and I, I don't know how tractable that would be. I'm, I'm a little scared, scared of it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because 12 equations is a lot of equations. And, um, <laughs> but uh, certainly you could put it on a, on a computer. I mean, you could, you could definitely iterate this. Um, and uh, then, then come up with cases, you, you know, manufacture cases by assigning the parameters appropriately for what you just described. Mm -hmm. So you could have, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to make sure I kind of understood yeah. where you're, where this was headed. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I may put this, if if I'm allowed to revise the paper, if the American Actors will, will accept it, you know, subject to revision, I'm thinking of even putting this in there just so that people know, can see what the full, full problem is and why it's useful to... Uh, not pursue this further, at least at this time, but instead to move to a, a strategy analysis. And the strategy analysis is one in which um, the, the host genome kind of does its own thing, evolves its nucleus subject to its own cost-benefit assessment, and then the microbes do their own thing. And then they come together um, at the colonization stage. So that's that's the hypothesis uh, I have for the evolution of so the formation. The reason you call that the strategy is because it's the association with like lack of Volterra, which is a game between the two the two microbe strains. No, so have... uh, no, uh, it it's not. The, it's not that it's that I'm using phenotypic variables. So let me, uh, let me come off of this. Uh, stop. How do I stop? Uh, oh, stop share. And let me bring up the other one. Share this. Okay. So if we go back to the, to the actual paper, uh, Um, yes, yeah, so if we skip along here. So here, um, so, 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 so this is the only part of the manuscript which deals with uh, the, the, simul, the interactive evolution or interactive dynamics of the host and the microbe. So here's where I'm assuming that the current capacity is a function of a phenotypic variable x right here. And conversely, then I'm going, going to assume that the, um, let me back. So, so, so the, ho the, the, so there's this phenotypic variable x right here, which which is how much the microbe gives to the host. And so it's, it's within host current capacity goes down if it gives more to the host, but meanwhile, the host fitness goes up. So that's, that's the altru what I'm calling the altruistic effort. And then, uh, then there's, so the X is a property of the microbe. It, it, it decides X. And then there's meanwhile Z over here, which is the amount of antibodies that the uh, uh, host makes. And the antibodies- Just a remark that may help. Forrest, when you multiply two linear equations together, which you would do if you're gonna do the multi-level fitness, you'd multiply the W times the K. And yeah. that gives you when, you, when you get that, you get a, a quadratic equation, which as you know, is the parabola. So it has a maximum. And that's, that's very important for this uh, idea, right? Yeah, so, so if there were multi-level selection that was accounting for the, uh, 
amount of altruism that the microbe supplies, this is what it ought to do. It ought to make 40 units of this stuff because that uh, winds up reducing its K a bit, adding to its W to the ho to the whole of Y fitness, and then that that's the value that maximizes the product because little w over here is its within host fitness, which is its current capacity, times the between host fitness, which is the capital W. So if this were really all about multi-level selection maximizing, you know, the unit, this is what the what the uh, uh, um, what the microbe ought to do. And this is how integrated it ought to be. But that doesn't happen. That microbe is excluded by, any, by a selfish microbe because of the density dependence within the host. And so, so here we have this host happily, I mean this microbe happily giving, giving up its K to, to improve the host. Well, great. But then some other microbe comes along and doesn't do anything, it has a higher K. Because it has a higher K, it can invade the host with the lower K and just wipe it out. So we wind up getting this competitive replacement right here of um, uh, the altruistic microbe with any selfish microbe. Or, and, and, um, and that was, that was disappointing, I would say from the standpoint of hoping multi-level selection would bail you out of uh, the problem of uh, uh, altruism. So what what's to do about it? Well, uh, on the other hand, let's look at it then from the host's point of view. The host is stuck getting all these things accumulating in it. And, uh, and, uh, and it can make antibodies to them. So how many antibodies should it make? Well, uh, uh, there's a, so I'm assuming here out of the blue that, that there's a decreasing return to scale for antibody production. The more you make, you know, it's just pretty soon you've gobbled up all the antibody, all the, mic, all the microbes that are there. There's no point making any more. But meanwhile, the fitness cost is linear. So if you write down the benefit minus the cost of antibody production, you get this equation here, and the benefit minus the cost uh, will then have a, a peak to it. And so, uh, and there's this parameter alpha, which is the amplitude of the benefit. And so if that's high, then you'd make a lot of antibodies. If that's low, you don't make antibodies. So, well, okay, what about this amplitude? Well, if the amplitude, of, the amplitude of the benefit's going to decrease with X, because if this is what the what the bacteria is making for you, well, then there's no reason to keep it keep it out. If it's not doing anything for you, well, then go and get it. But so I have this decreasing function, so that the amplitude of the benefit. De uh, the benefit of the antibodies, having the benefit of having antibodies, declines with the amount of altruism that the uh, microbe is making for you. So, uh, so that'll that would fit in right here. So, so, so if we look at where the peaks are, this is a graph of where these peaks are as a function of x. So, um, if you have no altruism by the microbe you get a lot of antibodies. If you get a lot of altruism by the microbe, well, then you don't make any antibodies at all. And for an intermediate level of, of microbe production, you get it in here. Now, a side effect of the antibody production is that uh, the <laughs> colonization parameter drops. And, and this... And so that's what this is a curve right here is um, a K naught. This is um, the amount of uh, K X min right here is the amount of altruism you have to supply in order for D to be high enough to invade. So if 
if your current capacity is a microbe, if, you, if your current capacity is 20, well then by golly you've got to supply at least, what is this, about 1.8 units of altruism in order for D to be high enough that you can successfully invade. And you could, you could uh, make anything in here. You could even offer more altruism than that. You could offer altruism up to this far. By the time you've offered altruism up here, then you don't, then the host isn't making anybody, any antibodies anyway. See, that's over here. So by the time you're up here at two, so, so the amount of altruism you should supply if you want to successfully invade is somewhere in this interval right here. So Jim, this is how you set up it, why it's a game. It's that, that you have the host setting its antibody production and you have the microbe setting its um, altruism. And these are both scalars. Parameters for strategies. Yeah, strategies, yeah. And so the, in that sense, it's a game. It's that one, they both, they have to set this. But it's doesn't, it's equilibrium is not, doesn't turn out to be just a Nash equilibrium or a bargaining solution or something like that. It's It winds up being a dynamic thing. So what's this star choice that you show on your diagram, I guess? Yeah, so this is the overall diagram right here, is that if we look at, imagine that uh, out there in the environment, there's this whole suite of different microbes. Yeah. And uh, some of them have a carrying capacity so low, uh, carrying capacity within host carrying capacity so low that if they were to try to enter the host, they would have to supply more altruism than even the altruism level to, to shut down antibodies. So this is, a, they can't do that. Um, if they can't make it here, then they certainly can't make it there. So the host, so this curve right here, the altruism needed to colonize, where it crosses the antibody <clears throat> level that shuts down, the altruism level that shuts down antibodies, where that intersection occurs, that sets up, that means that all the microbes here to the left are locked out of the uh, host and, and a colonization is allowed by all these microbes. Okay. So let's take a particular microbe right here. Let's take the one that's a star. Okay. It can get in. It's, it's to the right of this cutoff point. So it gets in. All right. Well, then we come to the question of how, what should it do? Should it just produce this much or should, should it produce even more? Well, here's where the simulations over here show that uh, if it produces that much, it winds up being excluded by someone else who produces just a little bit more than the blue line. That's this guy here. So these are both in, because they're both in this interval here, but this one excludes that. And so that's what you wind up with as your holobiont. It's a holobiont that supplies for its carrying capacity, uh, the least amount of resources that enables it to colonize. Um, and meanwhile, the whole uh, um, scenario is being determined by the uh, evolution in the host to begin with. So that's why I was using the phrase that what happens is that the host sets the prices. It says, if you're going to make a certain amount of altruism X, that I'm going to make a certain amount of antibody Y or Z. Okay, That's what I'm going to do. And, um, uh, and how does it determine the X and the Z? It's, it looks at its own cost-benefit analysis. It says, it costs me this much to make an antibody, and I only, and this is what I get for that antibody if you're making X. <clears throat> so for every X, the host decides what it's going to do, period. But then a side effect of that is that 
the colonization by the microbe is affected. Because if the host is keeping antibodies out, that's effectively lowering its colonization rate. So, so the, this is what I mean when I say the host sets the price. This is all right. This is what I'm gonna. You pay X, I will make make Z, and if Z affects your colonization, tough. If you can live with it, fine. So the microbe has a pay to play. It says, okay, all right, fine. If that's what I have to do to get in, I'll do it. And so the microbe then comes in and pays this much, but doesn't pay any more because if it pays more, it's going to be excluded by somebody. If it pays more, it's going to be excluded by somebody who pays the minimum that allows it to colonize. And, and the end result of this is that you have an integrated holobiont. You have a, a holobiont in which the, the host is making a certain amount of antibodies and so forth. And the microbe is making us giving the host a certain amount of uh, um, altruism, and that's that's an integrated unit. Then function that's a functionally or physiologically integrated unit. That's not an optimal unit, <laughs> but it's by golly, it's integrated. So is, is that clear this time around? So then selection, so I'm looking at the part of the blue line that's below the green line. That's yeah. where you have colonization. Yeah. So the microbe could be anywhere, any, a microbe anywhere along that blue line would, uh, you, would cause the holobiont to integrate. Yeah. So you have a non-unique um, integration or... Well, uh, what, what makes it unique, uh, well, it's, it's unique for any given current capacity, for any given type of microbe. So let's say this is a pseudomonas and this is a uh, bacterioid. Okay, so, I don't know. So it's different. the current capacity choice that makes it unique. Yeah, the current capacity choice makes it unique and the competition makes, uh, makes it unique. Yeah, okay, so I see you have to you have yeah. you get a new microbe if you move along that blue line. I, yeah. I wasn't thinking of that. Yeah, so this is a different microbe yeah. here with a different base carrying capacity. Right, yeah. So this is a, this is a hairy one, has a lot of expensive hairs. This is a smooth one, has no hairs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's, it's your two microbe strain model that enable you to talk about changing the D and then yeah. having uh, the possibility or have, studying the, uh, the invasion yeah. Uh, possibility. Yeah, and I added a slide to, to my talk, which I wish I hadn't deleted to begin with, which was, where, where is D? And um, this was the slide I unfortunately deleted. So, well, that's in the math, uh, the math appendix, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, but uh, the key thing right here is that in the Poisson distribution right here, and I, I thought that I, I'm unclear as to whether or not I'll be allowed to, to put this paper, this figure in the paper, because a lot of people have seen a picture of a Poisson distribution. But this parameter mu right here, uh, which I'm calling the Poisson density, oh. um, it's D. Here's the, here's the parameter, the colonization parameter, times G of T, where G is the ratio of microbes in, in the source pools of G, G of H and H of T. So, so this this is what sets whether you can colonize or not. Um, and this is the one that you'll recall I was interpreting in terms of the dilution of the uh, pool or uh, okay.
want to see that some more or should I go back? So that's in effect what the host is controlling. Yeah. Uh, when it wants to exclude uh, evil microbes. Yeah, exactly. So it can, so it controls D with Z. So D is a function of Z, the antibody production. And so that then, uh, you know, directly affects the colonization. So if, if D is small enough, nobody's going to colonize. And if D gets bigger, then you start to get a lot of colonization. Right. Yeah. So, so I guess, Joan, that the problem that I'd still have is that this D, whatever, this colonization, right? That, so we don't have anything in the biology that works like how you're saying the antibody production works, right? So for example, there's nothing in almost all of uh, the tree of life that has anything like that. And so then how do, so how do we go, how do we use it? Does that make sense? Well, I don't know if that's true uh, because the antibody production is uh, a function of how deleterious um, the uh, microbe is. Yeah, but then most, most of life doesn't have antibodies. Oh, so well, then how... that's, an, that's arguable. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm not, this is, I'm not an expert in this to be sure, but I take it that, uh, that, that Scott and, uh, I even argued with, I remember when I first read Tom Prado's uh, uh, book, he has a whole book about this. And, uh, and I read some articles from him and he was interested in my feedback. And I said, well, if you're making a big deal about uh, antibody, about the host immune system as being the decider of individuality. You know, that's the way photographers, uh, photograph, uh, the philosophers talk, that they're, they're interested in whether or not the antibody system is like a, a physiological um, curtain or um, f fence uh, mm -hmm. uh, around uh, an individual and that, and that it's the antibody system that determines what counts as an individual philosophically. And I said, well, I mean, uh, yeah, great. That might occur in mammals, you know, but how, how general is this? Uh, does everything have an antibody system? And lo and behold, um, it's arguably true that, that every multicellular thing does. Uh, and then Scott, who's not coming at it as a philosopher, he's a biologist, of course, is saying the same thing, that uh, these are, um, and so let me bring up, let me bring up one other, let me bring up the quotes from them and show that on the screen. Uh, um, I mean, there there are self versus non self, but they're very they're very different. Like, well, I don't know. Here, let me just share something. Know about this lead. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Let me yeah. share this too. Um, it's this. Okay. So, do you see that? This is the manuscript. Um, come on, come on. Okay, so let me quote to you, um, <clears throat> if I might. Holobiont assembly with ho host orchestrated species sorting brought about by the host, followed by microbial competition, extends existing discussion of how the immune system determines biological individuality. So Prado, 
in 2016 writes, quote, the immune system constitutes a discrimination mechanism accepting some entities in the organism and rejecting others, thus participating decisively in the delineation of the organism's boundaries. And then Gilbert and Tauber in 2016 write, quote, the immune system is the, the mediator of both defensive and assimilative environmental intercourse, where a balance of immune rejection and tolerance governs the complex interactions of the organism's ecological relationships. And I basically, uh, my model is basically elaborating on that kind of idea. Um, and so the argument is, is with them as to whether or not uh, the antibody system, the immune system, is as general as they're claiming it is. Hey, Forrest and Joan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't have to have antibodies in the classical sense. You could have other mechanisms that did this, bioactive lipids. You can even have phage involved, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, and, and I also have that in the paper, too, here. Um, um, yeah, so on 39, so I'm so at the top paragraph up here, our, the, the logic of HOSS, as I'm calling it, remains valid for other mechanisms of host selectivity. The host can employ toxic mucus yes. chemicals or physical deterrents like spines any mechanism, and this is key, applied in proportion to the benefit that the microbes supply. Moreover, and you can even flip it here, moreover, the host could even facilitate the entry of benefit-producing microbes rather than merely oppose entry, depending on the amount of benefit supplied. Host facilitation could be represented as a, as a so-called negative antibody, i.e. a, quote, probody, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, you're right, Ty. Um, I mean, I don't have to um, assume that the antibody system is general, but um, but I'm taken by the clarity, at least, if maybe not correctness, but the clarity <laughs> of this assertion by both uh, Scott Gilbert and Tom Perdo. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I get what you guys are saying, but molecularly, it's different, right? So, in general, the system doesn't look selective in the same way. It doesn't have that, it doesn't have that economic feedback, right? So, so Ty, do you know of anything that's, that has an economic feedback and in whatever we want to call it, just being very general? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, I don't know much of anything except for corals and a little bit about legumes. Um, and in the coral system, there does not appear to be what, what you guys are calling an economic feedback, but there does appear to be some sort of exclusionary mechanisms that select for specific um, clades of the zooxanthellae. And whether or not there's feedback in that is what's unclear. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, so, so I'm not I, requiring feedback, though, uh, Forrest, because right. I mean that's the point here is that it's the simultaneous action of uh, the host deciding what he wants to do for any given amount of uh, benefit, and then the the microbe just plain dealing with it, saying, "Okay, I'll pay to play," and uh, so I don't have uh, uh, rather feedback. than rather than feedback, I think he's referring to a cost a cost associated with um, producing yeah. whatever it is that provides that protection. Oh, there has to yeah, be and a that's cost. 
Well, no, and so there does, for, in order for, I think, your mechanism or what you're proposing there to work, there has to be a cost. But it's unclear if, say, corals, for the example, is it's unclear if they actually recognize that there is a cost or if they basically just do this every time. So, like, the, the example I'm thinking of in my head is we know that certain corals select clay B symbionts and certain corals select clay C symbionts, and there are trade-offs depending on which symbiont you select. But it doesn't really look like the corals like change that depending on anything. They just always, one genotype of coral always selects clade C, another genotype always selects clade D, and then natural selection sorts them out in the end. There's not like a, you don't select clade C because conditions are different and you like know to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I'm assuming <clears throat> All right, in that case, it would take a different model. <laughs> well, at, a, at another level, the, the mucus and the mucus that recruit certain phage to keep certain bacteria at bay, the, and the way they recruit the phage is there are different sugars they provide, right? And so I think there is a cost associated with that, and that's maybe at a different level than what you're talking about, but it is a mechanism that's uh, between the, the coral and the surrounding bacteria, I guess, not necessarily the zooxanthellae, right? Yeah, well, and actually, I'm, I'm not saying that there's not, that, what, that what, she's, what Joan is proposing there is not happening. I'm just saying it's unclear if it is or not. We know that the selection step that corals are selecting for specific microbes, but whether they're selecting based upon some altruistic cost function is a little bit, that's very unclear to me. Well, you're looking for something to test and- uh... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. yeah that, I mean, that seems, so do you have a, Bill, like, do you have any ideas? Do I? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you have to, uh, I mean, I, I know I'm being invasive here, but my field work, you know, when I, when I was doing empirical work, I was working with anolis lizards and intertidal barnacles. So <laughs> these microorganisms are a long way from my expertise for it. <laughs> And uh, so being able to suggest a bona fide experiment uh, and, you know, your, the bioinformatics you guys do is just amazing. And, and this is not my league. Uh, so what I, but one thing I did come up, one of the students mentioned to me, and I'll, I'll just throw this out there. Um, that there's this interesting article and let me bring that up too, uh, put and share that with you. Um, uh, You're talking about Becky's article? No. Uh, Is it that? Here, you have it. You have, let's see, take a look at this. Uh, stop, share, bring this guy up. Uh, okay, that's this one. Can you see this? Yeah, that's Becky's. And I'm not sure. Yeah, this is her, her thing, yeah. I don't know. Okay. okay. This is so-called yeah. Anna Karina, Karina the yeah. principal, um, is uh, it's an interesting idea because apparently there's a, a relative homogeneity among the holobionts who have intact immune systems, but once their immune systems are screwed up, then you get all kinds of stuff. And um, uh, yeah. ra random or chaotic. Uh, and that's, that would also be consistent, I must say, with uh, my idea that the immune system is what's necessary for, for orchestrating mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the accumulation or the uh, formation of a, uh, an integrated uh, microbiome. No, I'm not sure. So, I mean, Becky was one of my postdocs. And so 
I'm not sure that we would agree with her on this. <laughs> in fact, I would say it's probably the opposite of what she's saying in this article. Have you guys read this one, Ty? Have you seen this? I think, yeah, I, ha I have, and I've, I've discussed it pretty deeply with Becky over drinks at some point. Um, I think there are, there are times when Anna Karenina type scenarios take place, but I do not think that they are the the like overarching way that this normally happens. Anyhow, it's it, I see what you're saying here. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, if, if this were the case, uh, at any rate, I, for what it's worth, that that is well, okay. I mean, yeah. So that's consistent with the what my model here would predict. And if this doesn't take place, uh, or then that would be a rejection of my model. Yeah, it's, it's worth, it's not worth rejecting your model yet. We need to think about it in more detail. <laughs> no, but I'm trying to, I'm just trying to get how the argument really looks, yeah. especially at this <laughs> latter part. But I, I'm not, I have no emotional attachment to having my models. Yeah. Uh, falsified. <laughs> yeah. You know what I think we should do is we should theorist. I think what we should do is we'll beat him for dough and we'll argue with Thomas over wine. <laughs> I'm gonna have to think about it a little. I'm just trying to think because we probably already have the data. It's just that we have to go in and understand it more grammatically to test um, so we need a null model to work against, right? Does that make sense? Uh, Something that we could look against. But yeah. So maybe, so one thing I would suggest is what if we get Thomas uh, to talk? Why don't we see what, where he, how far he's gotten on his immune system being selective stuff? Tom, Tom Prado. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, that would be a good talk for us to all go through um, and see what he says now. He doesn't, he doesn't think very deeply in the, he doesn't think very deeply in the tree of life is the only thing. Um, yeah, he's not an evolutionary biologist. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's kind of in, into the molecular mechanism stuff a lot um yes that, that's cool though good so i so have, do you guys have yeah good, more questions a off the wall question um so have you ever thought of uh, of the microbe phage system as a whole of bion yeah um I, I've started to. Uh, I mean, Ben Ben just mentioned uh, one mechanism in the gut where mucus serves to exclude uh, phage. So I, I was just wondering about that uh, idea of a phage microbe. Well, by it. Yeah, uh, my my plan had been in this this grant that I have with more was to. I, I, I had thought that the, that the bacteria host problem that I, I had it in hand and that it would be take maybe six months or so to get it out there. Um, and that was based on the previous version where there was binomial sampling. And, um, and so I had proposed to work on the three level uh, uh, holobiont problem where you had phage inside of bacteria inside of a, a, a eukaryotic host and and I spent about four months or so working on that uh, oh. and then then I had to pull off that in order to go back to the to this holobiont paper this two level holobiont paper because of the need to use the Poisson distribution and puts yeah. on sampling and so on. Now, the reason for saying that is that uh, in, <laughs> prior to working on all three, uh, three levels simultaneously, uh, the question arose 
came to mind as to what to do about the two bottom levels, uh, the interaction of the phage and the bacteria. Right. And, um, and so I did a lot of reading on the models there, and I'm really unhappy with the existing models for that. Um, really? And yeah, which are, which are all mass action models that uh, go back to, actually they're time delay differential equations that go back to uh, a formulation from Alan Campbell, I think in the 60s or 70s. And, uh, and he was a viral, I used, he used he was at University of Rochester when I was an undergrad, and then he was on the faculty. <laughs> then he was on the faculty at Stanford when I was a grad when I was on the faculty. So I've known him for uh, oh he's died now, but uh, I'd known him for a good fifty years. At any rate, his time delay differential equation is basically a mass action thing where you have the the rate of viruses going up depending on uh, the collision you know, the product of the viruses and the bacteria and the rate of the bacteria changing based also on the collision. But the time delay is because they're allowing for a certain time between viral infection and uh, release uh, from the bacterial host. And, and then subsequent workers continue to use that uh, basic framing. And I don't I don't like that uh, for several reasons. Uh, it's not enough biology in it, uh, for one thing. Um, just this random collision business. It goes back really to the to the Volterra model, Volterra predator prey model. It's basically an adaptation of a Volterra predator prey model, um, and I I think it should be in discrete time, and I would take as a discrete time interval. Uh, the the uh, time, I forget what it's called, the lysis time, the time between infection and the time to release. And, um, and then to pose it so that you could uh, ask the question of whether, whether you could ask strategy questions. When should a, should a virus um, lyse or not? And it, whether it does or not should depend on the reproductive rate of the bacteria that it's in, because it may, if the bacteria that it's in is reproducing faster than it could reproduce, if it just lysed, it should stay inside. And there should, should be considerations like this that should be allowed in the model, that should be part of it. And then if, it's in, if the setup is in discrete time, also I want it to be sampled. So I want the and there's data on this that the uh, bacteria has a Poisson sample of virus particles in the environment. And um, uh, one of these old fellas, uh, um, can't remember his name, but in the 1920s actually measured that there was uh, a Poisson distribution of viral particles in, bac in bacteria. And so I want, so I, so I do want to see it in, as a holobion in that sense that the viruses are, are sampled from an environment and that the virus particles are contributed to the environment. So, so I want more biology. I want it to be in discrete time, and I and I want it to be set up so that it could then be built in as the bottom tier in a three tier model. Because that's a long answer to your question, but yeah, I have started to think about that a lot, but I. Can't, I'll get back to it if I can get this project done. All right, so uh, we're getting kind of late. Yeah. So that was really helpful. All right, guys, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks so much, good. everyone. Thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, John. Yeah, you bet.